And when it hit the wood, instead of burying itself in the wood, it glanced off the log yeah. and deflected into my leg. Okay. And, and it's like time stood still for just, just a moment where I saw the metal, this razor sharp metal hit my leg and I saw my skin well up. Okay. This is all in slow motion. And then it kind of like, just like looked up at me like, sorry, boss, we're, we're going to split here. <laughs> Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 74 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn about knives and knife collecting. Hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, and anyone who loves knives. And Bob, that last phrase, anyone who loves knives, or should I say blades, that's uh, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to be uh, diving into today with our special guest. Indeed we are. Uh, well, you know, this is the holiday season. Well, it just passed. It's a sentimental time of year for me. And uh, I was at uh, my ancestral home recently. And hanging out with my my brother. And a lot of people who follow this channel know that my brother's an awesome guy. And he's gotten me so many knives and uh, made me so many cool sheaths and leather goods over the years that he is an integral part of the Knife Junkie journey. Because mm. I'm on a journey like everybody else. <laughs> um, and uh, so I just wanted to have him here because we were, we were kind of reeling in the years. And all these stories kept popping up. Remember that time you cut yourself this? Remember the time in New York? And uh, so we decided we should do a podcast where we just have some knife stories. Yeah, definitely a different one for us, but uh, I think it's going to be a really fun one. But before we get into that, I want to remind you that uh, if you want to help support the Knife Chunky podcast, the Knife Chunky uh, website, the Knife Chunky uh, YouTube channel, uh, if you're going to be shopping on Amazon or eBay for a knife or anything, go to thenifechunky.com slash shop Amazon or thenifechunky.com slash shop eBay, and uh, you can uh, purchase whatever you want to purchase from there. We'll get a very small commission. It does not affect the price that you'll pay in the long run, but it does help support the Knife Junkie channel. And if you want to find daily deals on Amazon, well, just go to thenifechunky.com slash daily deals. So I don't want to wait any longer, Bob. I want to hear these crazy <laughs> knife stories and, and how you have cut yourself in numerous ways. So uh, what do you say we, we have the Bob and Vic show? Let's, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> I would like to introduce my brother, Vic. Vic, welcome to the Knife Chunky Podcast. It's great to have you. Thank you. I will uh, call you Vic, Vito, Victor. Those, those names all work for my brother. So, uh, Vic. Not necessarily a knife junkie, but uh, how did you put it uh, when... I said a blade enabler. Okay, so exactly what is a blade enabler? Okay, let me explain. First of all, I said I'm not a knife junkie because it's not, you know, knives. I don't like wake up and then go to sleep and think about nothing but knives in between. But that said, I love knives and I, I love the um, the heft of them, the... You know, like the mechanicalism of them, if you will, like mm -hmm. just how they operate, uh, what they do. They're very useful tools. So I, I don't, I, I kind of have a collector's heart anyway in, in most things that I do. So being that I do like knives, I, I tend to have a lot of them, but I don't like check out the internet every night to see what's new in the blade world, that kind of thing. Right. The enabler part comes from the fact that my brother is a knife junkie and I'm only too happy to support that. A hobby by either buying him knives um, when I see something that I think he likes or by making a sheath for something that he either needs a sheath for or something that he has a sheath for, but it's kind of, eh, yeah. you know. You use the word habit. I mean, a hobby. I, I was <laughs> mm -hmm. going to say maybe it's a more of a habit or addiction. <laughs> <laughs> a lifestyle. It's a way of life. There you go. <laughs> it's a way of life. But also the other thing is that like, you know, as someone who as a collector's heart, I know sometimes I want to get something, but I really can't justify it. So I assume Bob is in the same position, mm -hmm. and so he'll buy me knives. So, Vic, why is it that you like knives? It's it's something that we've shared our whole lives. Uh, yeah. We're men of a certain age at this point, and uh, so yeah. it's been it's been quite a few years. You and I have kind of shared this 
this thing. Where did it come from for you? I know uh, for me, a lot of it came from you because you're my older brother. But so where did it come yeah. from for you? I've been thinking about that. And I think there's there's really kind of two places. I think the primary place is grandpa. Mm-hmm. OK, so our maternal grandfather was an artist and a craftsman and an outdoorsman. Yeah. He spent his whole life professionally and personally in that field. He built his own home. He had this absolutely amazing workshop. Bob, I don't know how much you remember about that, but it was like, it was just unbelievable. And it wasn't that big, but it had everything packed into it that you could possibly imagine that you would need for any kind of project. All neatly and nicely. All neatly and nicely. He had he had baby food jars nailed up to the ceiling like joists that had all manner of different, you know, bolts, screws, everything. And he knew where everything was. And I, you know, when we would go there as kids, I used to love going into the workshop and doing little projects with him. When I was very young, I asked him for a knife. I asked him specifically for an army knife. <laughs> he gave me this slip joint, which I know y'all can't see, but it's a it's an old rosewood handled or scaled or gripped or whatever you want to say, slip joint that has, well, he engraved my name in it. That's called an electrician's knife, by the way. Well, funny you should say that, Bob, because he told me it's an army knife. It is absolutely not an army knife. <laughs> um, but where he he engraved my name, you can see, and I never saw this until many, many, until I was an adult, actually, but you can see where he sanded off an electrician's name. So he got this from an electrician as like a, a giveaway kind of thing. Right. And you can see it says, you can barely see it, the word electrical. And then down below it says, you know, West Nyack, New York, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but it, you can't see it, but you can see where he kind of sanded it away. So he told me this is an army knife and that completely fueled my imagination. One one of the projects we did when I was a kid was actually make a knife. And that's this knife here. And I'll describe it. What it is, is basically it was a saw, right, that he had, an old saw. And I remember, I don't know what prompted us to actually embark on this project, but I, you know, I remember being in the basement with him in his workshop making this. And he literally took an old saw and we shaped it, he shaped it into this kind of knife blade. And then you can see, you know, he made this handle yeah. out of wood yeah. and we just, you know, shaped it, finished it, put it all together. So the uh, the, the teeth of the saw acts as the uh, saw blade on the back of the knife, yeah. like a survival knife. Yeah, I was so exactly. jealous during this whole thing, by the way. I was like, were you there when we did? Yeah, this? I remember all this happening. I was like, you why is he not making a knife with me? <laughs> <laughs> It's because I'm better than you. Oh, boy. Um, But then, no, I'm joking. Um, But then, to top it off, we had a sort of subsidiary project, which which was to make the sheath out of leather. And um, I guess that was a portend of what was to be, because later in my life, I would make my own sheaths and whatnot. But um, it's got my initials on it. You know, it's just, it's really cool. And I, I still have it. And I, I love it. I cherish it. Um, so there's that. And then we had a neighbor a couple doors down and they had kids that were basically the ages of Bob and me and, and my, our sister. And we would kind of hang out when we were really, really young back in the early seventies. And they had this big, big house that had this absolutely enormous living room. And it was the kind of living room that nobody it was, was a allowed. Museum. <laughs> it was like a museum. Nobody was allowed to go into it. And it had like big shaggy carpets. Think nineteen early seventies, right? And big big por- shaggy porcelain carpets. Porcelain leopards. <laughs> and porcelain leopards. It was just like and it was like this forbidden zone. We were not allowed in it. But on the far side of it was the father's den. Okay. And if we weren't allowed in in the living room, the den was like absolutely <laughs> like we just weren't allowed to be there. So on the wall, it was like a wood panel den, and on the wall was a Chris dagger. And I remember as a kid just like just venturing through that vast like museum space, just gone, oh God, we're going to get busted. And then <laughs> yeah. just, like just quietly like sneaking into that room just to look at this, at this dagger. Yeah. And it was just, it was cool. That dagger, uh, there was, so there was a Chris dagger that was out of, uh, I can't, I can't remember if it was in or out of the sheath, but we took it, it out. out of the sheath. And then there was a saber over it. And then there was some sort of like muskety kind of thing. And, uh, 
now that I think about it, it's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting because knowing the man who's done that was he wasn't necessarily that guy, but it was a cool adornment that men had back then. Well, of course, you yeah. put a sword on the wall, you know. <laughs> I, yeah. I like that, uh, that manly stuff. So, uh, one thing that, uh, I have talked about here and there is a toy knife you had when we were kids that yes. I, I know I can trace a lot of my obsession back to. It was, um, it was about a seven inch bladed plastic buoy knife with a black yep. handle. And, uh, I, I always tried to play with it. And, and, uh, you know, you were a very generous, awesome brother, but you never let me play with that knife. <laughs> <laughs> and that just fueled, and, and I, I, so much so that I remember going to mom and complaining. And, and then the next, uh, you know, next birthday, I got, I got a, uh, I got a toy, um, you know, plastic knife, but it just wasn't as cool as yours. You know, it just wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I got that for Easter. Again, that was a grandma, grandma, and grandpa's house. We used to go there for, for Easter. I don't know if you remember that yeah. little detail. Uh, I think the reason that it was so awesome is because it was, it was actually built like a real knife. So the, the blade and the tang were like dull silver plastic. And then the handle scales were, were two separate ple- pieces of plastic yeah. kind of put together over where the handle would be. And then the sheath was like a, I don't know if you remember this, but it was like a red plastic yes. kind of sheath. And, to me, that's just like, you know, shows it's a little bit of a sign of the times. In the 70s, you could get stuff like that. You could get like toy M16s and toy Tommy yeah. guns and they were And you could give them away for Easter. <laughs> yeah, and you could get them for Easter. It was it was a thing of beauty. And actually, I was telling Bob this other story. It's not a knife story, but it's just another kind of sign of the time story. So in that era, we used to ride the bus to school, obviously. And this neighbor kid whose father had the Chris, he and I were talking to the bus driver once and she was you know she was a woman who her if you think about the time her husband was a world war ii veteran and she was telling us that he had a hand grenade from the war and and we said oh can we play with it and she said sure and so she brought this hand grenade on the bus and she gave it to my friend then the the plan was he would get it for a week then i would get it for a week and then we had to give the grenade back so he he had the grenade um and during his week he was playing with it he threw it up in the air and he caught it with his face and so he ended up with this big black eye and she got a little nervous and took the grenade back so i never got my so week with unfair. the grenade it was so unfair <laughs> but the thing is the only you know reason i'm raising that is because it just shows you kind of what a different world we live in today that would probably oh. never ever happen speaking okay <laughs> speaking of a different world you and i both spent quite quite a number of years living in new york city uh yep. and and part of that time overlapped which was cool because we lived you know close enough to see each other on a regular basis some things happened you know now that i don't live in new york city i can't imagine how long i lived there doing things that were just so illegal uh <laughs> just in terms of like and i wasn't i wasn't <laughs> intending on it i was just a knife enthusiast you know living my life and and kind of ignoring the fact that I was in a very, you know, unpermissive place. Like, yeah, you know, I, 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 I had the attitude I kind of still have today, which is, well, I don't really get in trouble with cops, so I'm not going to worry about it. I should be fine. <laughs> I should be fine. Now, yeah. now I have responsibilities, and uh, you know, so I'm, I'm a little less cavalier. But you know, you and I did experience a number of, of things in New York. But I, I, here's a here's a sign of things that I don't think would happen in New York now. Uh, I was I was on the subway and I had my um my cold steel four inch serrated vaquero in my pocket you know <laughs> the the el hombre it's called and uh, that was kind of my everyday carry for a long time yes sir similar to this one except smaller <laughs> yeah so I I had that in my pocket I was getting off at Twenty Third Street and my bag I was shifting my bag to to put it on my back so I could get off the subway and. And the bag just just grabbed the clip right out of my pocket. Uh, and in slow motion, this big knife fell on the floor in front of everybody. Oh and, you know, New York, <laughs> it fell on the floor and it opened up. You know, it just like <laughs> fell just in the right way that it opened up so you could see this big, shiny, sinuous, scary blade. Yeah. And then it scuttled across the floor until it, <sighs> until it reached the gap and it fell, fell through onto the tracks. Uh, <laughs> and then the train rolls away and I had to get to work but I'm like oh, I'm like God. this is worth being late for cuz it is <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> I'm not going to come to this subway station you know for the rest of my my time here and glance uh-huh. down at the knife 
and or 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 worse yet, you know, some kid would just jump down on the tracks and get it himself. Uh, so you can't have that. Then you've yeah. Then I've given yeah. it away to a stranger. So I went. I got the station agent, and and they had to call someone from a different station <laughs> to get like the grabber. And it took about an hour, and I was late for work. But I just stood there like over it on the platform, looking down, like no one is getting my knife. Right? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. New York. I I, I used to uh, carry that big six inch Vaquero for a while, and I was like, I had this attitude, man. I don't, so everyone who's listening to this, don't take this attitude, especially in New York. You'll end up in jail. But uh, I used to carry that big six inch knife, and I was like, oh, it's okay. You know, I'm a martial artist, and I'm training in knife stuff. This is cool, and I'm an enthusiast. Really, it's okay. But you know, I don't think the law would see it that way. <laughs> yeah, and that was that was a long time ago. Yeah, you know, that was yeah. twenty years ago. That more was than a, that. Things were a little different. I remember being there. Um, I was flying out of LaGuardia. We were going to uh, going to the wedding of a guest of this show. Actually, uh, when Drew was getting married up in Maine, uh, we flew up there, and I had my beloved Kershaw Storm Two in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, oh no, it wasn't in my pocket. What happened was I packed it away with my suit and my good shoes in my uh, luggage. And then the last minute, I'm like, damn, those are good shoes. I don't want them to get lost. I'll put them in my carry-on. Forgot oh. about the Kershaw Storm 2, which was a big Ken Onion, you know, almost it was three and a half inch Ken Onion um, recurve. Cool knife for then. And, you know, got to the got to the uh, TSA. I guess this was, yeah, I got to the TSA and they saw it. And they weren't having it, obviously. <laughs> and so, like, this cop came. And a uh, an agent, a TSA agent manager came, and uh, the cop saved me. He was actually pretty darn cool. He was like, he kind of looked at the TSA guy and said, kind of like, this guy's mine. And the TSA guy backed away and pulled me over, and and he looked at me sternly and he's like, these guys are such hard odds. Let okay, <laughs> look, let's let's get let's get this knife to your destination. Uh, I'll see if we can pull your bag. So. He actually helped me. We went to the uh we went to the bag baggage agent and it uh -huh. ends up the the bag had already been loaded on the plane and it was too late and and I was like, you know, I'm not going to I he's like, "Well, you could try and mail it." And I'm like, "Wait. My wife is is already killing me. I'm not going to take the time to try and mail this thing." So so I just said, "Here, you know, you do a hard job. Thanks for looking after us. Uh, you take the knife." And he's like, I, "I'm sorry, sir. I I can't accept that knife. I, you know, it's it's not professionally ethical." I, I'm like, and, and I'm like, really? You can't just like, you know, because I don't, I don't want to throw it in the garbage. She's like, well, if I were to find it on the floor, I could pick it up <laughs> and it could be mine. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> what do you know? Look at what I found. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So that that guy, that guy probably saved my butt, you know, from That's hours awesome. of interrogation. From oh yeah, yeah. I've been I've been pulled pulled aside coming back from out of the country, and not because of a knife or anything, just because of immigration, and it's a it's a real hassle, and you miss. You know, I miss my connection, and we suspect that you're with the mafia, Mister Demarco. <laughs> I, I have a a knife cut story I want to tell you because this is also uh... okay. I got a knife cut story for you too. Well, let me hear yours. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was gonna start with the time that you cut me. You want to oh, start with that yeah. one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's do. So this was I don't know what ten years ago, maybe maybe a little more. It was definitely like in our adult life. Mm -hmm. You got me this cold steel spike oh, God. for Christmas. Yeah. That's the Tanto spike. Tanto's, and it's the old kind of handle style mm -hmm. with the wrap. It's beautiful, sweet little honey. You know, I, I, I like it. I love it. And so does Bob. And so he gave it to me. And then, you know, I opened it up under the Christmas tree and I was playing with it. And he pretty quickly got it out of my hands and he started playing with it. <laughs> And within, I don't know, within an hour, we were in our mother's kitchen. She's making breakfast. You know, our wives are about doing whatever. And he has the, has the spike and commences to pretend to mug me and, <laughs> and, and ends up slicing the top of my hand. And I still have the scar. You won't be able to see it on this camera, but I still have this little scar there. And it, there was this whole dynamic where we both were looking at each other like, oh, my God, that just happened. And me going like, oh, my God, that hurts. I got to, you know, I got to take care of this. But trying to hide that fact from our mother, who's 
they're making because we know we would both get in trouble and for some reason i would know i probably would have gotten into more trouble being the victim no being the older one who should be responsible being the older one being the older so that's that's the time you cut me and then um this is this is my mother of all i cut myself stories because i've got a ton of those i you know i handle knives in um you know enough to cut myself relatively often but this one is the time I cut myself with my SE Junglus, which you, you can't, I have it here. You cannot see it obviously on the podcast, but it's a big knife. It's easily like 10 inch bladed know, outdoor knife. Yeah. And it's, it's heavy steel and it's just, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful knife and it's really, it's really extremely sharp. And so this, I, I remember this exactly. This was in 2000, in the summer of 2011. So almost, I guess, almost 10 years ago. And I had been watching videos on YouTube of nothing fancy splitting wood. And I thought, oh, I could do that. Because we had just we had just had a couple of trees taken down. And um, I had a lot of wood to, to, to deal with. And so I go out there and I get, you know, a suitable stick and I start batoning through these, um, these logs. And this thing just cut through them like butter. Okay. It was a thing of beauty to watch how this, you know, cause it's got, it's very sharp. It's got this, this thick, you know, steel blade and it's just, it's a monster. It's and full it was flat just, ground. It's like a wedge kind of in, in yeah, cross section. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I'm going, going, going about after about like 10 or 12 logs. I'm like, I wonder if it's still sharp. So, you know, I kind of shave some hair off of my forearm and it's still sh- like razor sharp. And I'm like, oh, this thing is awesome. Okay. So I keep going, going. And finally, I get to a point where I feel like I, I need a break. And I'm going to go and get some water or whatever. And instead of putting the knife back into its sheath, I figured I'm going to put this thing through its paces. And I wanted to see how deep I could bury it into one of the logs. <laughs> that Sounds I like a good it. idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I lift it up over my head and I... I didn't give it a lot of muscle, but I just wanted the momentum of this awesome steel blade to just like carry it in in a full arc down into the wood. And when I bring it down and when it hit the wood, instead of burying itself in the wood, it glanced off the log yeah. and deflected into my leg. Okay. And, and it's like time stood still for just just a moment where I saw the metal this razor sharp metal hit my leg and I saw my skin well up. Okay. This is all in slow motion. And then it kind of like, just like looked up at me like, sorry, boss, we're, we're going to split here. <laughs> and it fell apart. <laughs> like, like where the blade was. And then the blood just, the blood was like, all right, we're going. And it just like started gushing out. Okay. And I was like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? So I pulled I pulled my belt off and I put it around my leg and I kind of like ran hobbled back to the kitchen holding, you know, holding the belt in one hand and holding my shorts up in the other hand. My wife wasn't there, but my mother-in-law was there. Oh, good. Okay. And I'm like, I, I, I'm like, Leia. And she comes in. And by this time I was like, I was literally like kind of feeling faint a little bit. And so I'm, I'm on the floor in a pool of blood with this <laughs> gash. Okay. And she starts screaming, ah! and I'm like, I have help. we need to, you know, you know, call 911 or something. I'm like, but I'm like, don't let, don't let Victor in here. I don't want him to see this, my son. And so just then my wife comes back. She assesses the situation. She's always kind of cool in an emergency. She disappears, comes back with a cane and gets me in her car and takes me to an urgent care thing. So I get to urgent care. I walk in the front door. I got the cane in one hand and I'm, 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 I got the cane and I'm holding up my shorts with one hand. I'm holding the belt in the other hand, which is like keeping all the blood in. (laughs) I I like, I I like, I like zombie walk up to the, to the front desk. And I, I said, I need a doctor. And the lady says, you know, what's wrong? And I tell her, I caught myself. And as she's, you know, as she is taking care of whatever she's taking care of, I hear this guy in the waiting room behind me and he goes, oh, 
you know that guy's going first. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, I'm that guy. <laughs> you know, because there's like a whole waiting room full of people with the sniffles, right? And I walk in with this knife wound. And long and short of it is they, they got me in there. They couldn't handle it because it required, like, I would guess you would say minor surgery because there were like two levels. Dear Lord, did an Essie Hunglis do this? <laughs> yeah. They, um, you know, the, it required two levels of stitches, one at like the tendon level and one at the skin. Le- and they just didn't want to, they didn't want to deal with it. So they sent me to a hospital. But while we were waiting, I was in the back and the doctors, you know, the doctors examining my leg and, you know, this nurse comes in and says, to my wife, she says, "Ma'am, we need you to come out and sign some um, papers." And when she when she left, the doctor said, "Do you feel comfortable at home? <laughs> oh, Do you feel safe?" My God. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, "Oh yeah, this is a hundred percent, you know, me. Okay, it's <laughs> not you, her. Trust do you me. Feel safe? <laughs> well, I don't know. I live with an idiot. <laughs> Should I feel safe?" <laughs> uh, I, I the other day we were talking, we were going over these stories, and you reminded me of something. Uh, that I would never do now, that I did then, <laughs> whenever that was. Uh, this was the the consulate story. When you lived, uh, yeah. well, it just happened, I think, the weekend of your wedding. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so it was in New York City. It was on the, it was uh, Midtown on the East Side. So there are a lot of embassies around there and a lot of consulates in your old neighborhood there. So what I can piece together of this evening, uh, was that, it, it was all um, fueled by liquid courage, I think. <laughs> and um, I remember I was wearing a cool new jacket. It was a, a coat, almost knee length. And I, I just remember feeling, you know, it was this weekend of your of your wedding. And I was kind of dressed up the whole weekend. And I remember just feeling like James Bond walking around in my cool <laughs> cool coat. And at one, uh-huh. at one point, I was wandering around. It was over kind of by the East River. And I'm wandering around by all these consulates, and I think I was probably stealing little sips of whatever I was drinking that night, and just kind of wandering around, having a city experience. And uh, I find myself on a walkway, it's like a catwalk, over the grounds of one of these consulates. And uh, I had my, uh, I believe it was the Vaquero Grande again, or the uh, the. Uh, the El Hombre, whatever. I was playing with my knife <laughs> as, as, as happens. And it fell out of my hand and it fell off the catwalk onto the lawn of this consulate. And for some reason, I think it was the Brazilian consulate because I remember thinking, Oh, wow, well, I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and this happened. <laughs> and I thought that that was some tremendous coincidence. But anyway, so this, this knife fell, fell out of my pocket or out of my hand off the catwalk and onto the lawn of this consulate. And uh, I was just courageous enough at that time to say screw it man i'm in my james bond coat i'm in a suit how cool do i look i'm just gonna get down here i'm gonna climb over that wall i'm gonna get my knife and uh and i did that i I got down and it had um it had like brick embutments and between it had like the big wrought iron kind of fence and it didn't have spikes on top it had like kind of fleur-de-lis on on top so i just grabbed it kind of in the corner where the brick meets the the iron and pulled myself up and over and you know i was in good, much better shape than i could do that with some ease and i got the uh got the knife and i climbed back over and i remember thinking afterward like how cool i must have looked jumping off the top of that fence <laughs> with my cool coat kind of billowing in the wind like a cape uh-huh. so yeah that That's wouldn't awesome. have happened if i didn't have butterfingers but yeah but now i suspect if i if you if you attempt something like that now this is this it must be the back in my day show because back in yeah, my right. day you could you could climb over a consulate wall and not get sniped and get grenades from your bus driver. <laughs> yeah, and get grenades from your bus driver. So Vic, uh, did I ever tell you about the uh my 42nd birthday with the with the Endura? Uh I don't think so. Well, so, okay, 42nd birthday here here at the house and uh you know, my wife has a giant family. They all come. There's about 25 or 30 family. And then, and then we had friends from our martial arts school. We had friends from the neighborhood. We had old friends, you know, multi generational hang all day long. And, uh-huh. uh, and, and Mari tells everybody 
So this is Bob's 42nd birthday, and he loves tequila. And yeah, you know, I, I like tequila, <laughs> but she, uh-huh. she, I think she wanted to build up a tequila collection in the bar in our basement. So she said, <laughs> it's a tequila bar. Everyone has to bring a bottle. Of te- so everyone showed up. Um, well, many people showed up bearing fine bottles of tequila. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a magnanimous guy. So they'd come through and I'd be like, Oh, God, thanks for coming. Thanks for being. We have to do a shot. Welcome. <laughs> Let's do a shot. So I did that uh, more than several times, and uh, you know I just got three sheets to the wind. And I remember uh, I I started trying to grill. I had like a thousand sausages and chorizos, and uh, Mari's uncle, who's a great grillsman, comes over and he's like, "Yeah, he is." He's like, "Let, let me take care of this. Why don't you go enjoy your party?" <laughs> he saw me teetering <laughs> over the flames, and he didn't want me to 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 jack up the sausages. Anyway, later that night. Uh, I was found in the bathroom bleeding, and um, what had happened was uh, all of those tequilas led to, you know, I mean, just being ridiculous. It's it's not responsible behavior, and I've changed my ways somewhat since then, but uh, I, I had just gotten a brand new Endura for my birthday, uh, a, uh, you know, almost four-inch, full flat ground, razor sharp uh, spider co, and I started practicing martial arts against a tree. And, uh, <laughs> and I decided to, to stab the tree and the Endura doesn't have much. St- <laughs> yeah. The Endura doesn't have much in the way of finger protection, uh, in, in a thrust. And so my hand wrote up on the blade and it just, here's the great thing though, people keep your knives sharp. And, and actually those kind of cuts, they suck and they hurt, but they don't hurt as much and they heal much quicker because the, the cut is so, you know, it just comes back together. So I come in, apparently, uh, Mari's aunt said, I said that I was trying to get mosquitoes <laughs> with the knife. But anyway, I come in and I leave a trail of blood and, and, uh, my mother-in-law was, gets involved also. And she, she notices the trail of blood and follows it, finds me and then gets, gets Mari. And they try to take me to the hospital and I'm just not having it because, you know, it's, I'm not going to end the party by going to the hospital. So yeah. we just bandage it up, get it real tight and everything. And I'll tell you what, Vic. That that wound, which was deep and bloody, was healed in a week. That's a wow. testament to two things. Spyderco's awesome edge and my incredible genetics. <laughs> I'm like Wolverine. <laughs> just, just That's awesome. Well, uh, anyway, uh, 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 there's another thing. Uh, I, I wanted to get this in, and it's uh, realizing how one of one of the very early things for me that got me obsessed with knives. Vic, do you remember the knife that used to be in the garage with the stag handle that came from Cole's farm? Do you remember that yeah. story? Mhm. Okay, so the story is we were at uh, I was I was at a local farm with my mom in the 70s. It was when uh it was like a, a the kind of farm you bring your kids to and you and there are there are like rope bridges and pony rides and little yeah, uh, feed the cows. And, yeah, yeah, and and, and donkeys and stuff. stuff. It was it was cool. It was fun for a, for a little kid. And we're walking out onto to a pier that goes into the middle of this lake. And um, I remember looking up and I was sliding my hand along the railing. And I was just kind of absentmindedly looking at my hand. And it came to a screeching halt because mom like pulled back on my hand. And I and I noticed that my hand stopped just shy of that knife. It was like a, a marbles <sighs> hunting knife stuck yeah, yeah. Chunk, right in the right in the uh, <laughs> thing. And mom was so she was furious that this knife was out in the open and and I thought I could have cut my hand clean off. I was like, Oh my God, I came so close. You know, this was almost the end. Um, but I remember she grabbed the knife, put it in her purse and, uh, that knife lived in our garage for years and years and years. It did all sorts of outdoor work. It got all sorts of play, got thrown at trees. I wonder and what that. happened to it. Well, I was just, I was telling Jim last week while I was home over Christmas, uh, I was, going through they don't live in the house we grew up in but i was going through their stuff in the garage hoping to find it and it just it disappeared along the way Uh, that's too bad i remember one of us tried to sharpen it on that old grinding wheel dad had in the basement we just (laughs) obliterated (laughs) a thing of beauty after that yeah Yeah. my god so bob let me ask you a question we you know like i said before we've exchanged a lot of knives over the years Mm -hmm. what do you think is your favorite knife that I got you? Oh, uh, without question, it's the uh, pit fighting gauntlet. And you didn't really get that for me. You made that for me. 
Okay. But, uh, I mean. Um, I appreciate you saying that. If I, if I had to get rid of everything you've ever gotten me, uh, the, the last thing would definitely be the pit. Okay. You got to say, you got to tell, you got to explain how this thing came into being. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so the pit fighting gauntlet is if you all, I'm sure most people who are listening to this have seen Conan the Barbarian. And there's a scene uh, where Conan is in his pit fighting years where he's got these two massive leather gauntlets with um, blades coming out the end. And so shortly after I got into uh, the hobby of making things out of leather, um, and I'll give a hat tip to Michael O'Mockerly, uh, who indirectly kind of got me into that and inspired me to, to start looking at that. Because by the way, um, Bob got me a knife when he was on his honeymoon in Greece, and it didn't really come with a sheath, so to speak. It just had this plastic thing that went over the blade to prevent you from cutting yourself. And I wanted a nice leather sheath. So I figured after I saw Michael O'Mockerly making them on that 60 Minutes episode, I thought, you know what, I can do that. And so I looked into it and I just got into it and started making sheaths and stuff like that. So Bob said, Vic, wouldn't it be cool if you made a pit fighting gauntlet like the one in Conan the Barbarian? And I thought, yeah, that would be awesome. Wait, wait, wait. There's a part you're forgetting, Vic. Okay. What what is that? It started as a simple leather cuff. I just wanted a leather cuff (laughs) initially, just a little leather cuff with a belt, you know, that that cool guys wear on their wrists. And I was like, you know, it'll be like in case I get in a knife fight, it'll protect my wrist. But it'll just be a little, you know, two inch wide piece of jewelry, basically. So how did it turn into the pit fighting gauntlet? We started adding. First, I was like, could you put a belt on it? How about two belts? And then and then you'd be like, what if I line it with shearling? Like, yeah, that'd be cool. Well, what if there's a blade? (laughs) (laughs) So the long and short of it is I watched the movie. I spent a lot of time freeze framing in that scene just to just to kind of get a sense for what it was, you know, what it was all about. And then and then I said to Bob, I was like, well, do you want it like right handed or left handed? And he said left handed to kind of like more as like a a defensive kind of thing. And so then, you know, I spent before I even, you know, cut the first piece of leather, I spent um, a lot of time thinking about like, well, okay, so where do I get a blade for this? Because I'm not, I'm not a metalsmith. I don't know how to make these things. So what, you know, how do I do this? And I was thinking, well, maybe like a push dagger, because that kind of has the same, like the geometry you need handle relative to knife. But that, yeah, it's, you know, I'm not going to get a big push dagger, you know? And then I thought, well, maybe I could get a, a big knife and just like drill a hole through the hand. I was like, nah, it was just stupid. And finally, it occurred to me that the bayonet that was manufactured for the Russian SKS rifle has like swings out. So it has already has like a hole in the handle exactly mm. where I needed it. So I found one. And basically built the handle around that and then built the whole rest of the of the gauntlet around and kind of just like built it up around that. And then as I was doing this took this took some time. It took at least a month or two or maybe even three by the time I was done. But, you know, as as I was going through it, I kept thinking about, well, it would be cool if it had this and that. And before you knew it, it was like adorned with spikes yes. and it's got like some um uh like cowhide designs on it and stuff. Yeah, there was there was uh, there was That's a lot cool. of back and forth on the design of this. Um, it it okay. It, it has never been featured in a video this week without fail. I will make a video showing this thing because to to describe it, it's 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 not what you're thinking. It's much bigger. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not what you're thinking. It's way better. Uh, but it's, so the idea was, if it's on my left hand, you know, in the fictional pit fight that i'm going to get into in the future <laughs> i can i can wield a sword or an axe with my right hand my good hand and then be able to defend with the gauntlet but the cool thing is is that uh that sks bayonet is about 13 inches so so the overall length of this thing runs from from past the elbow to 14 or 15 inches past the fist and and it it's comes off it, it comes off at an angle so that you can so that if you punch with it the bayonet comes off just at the right angle. So, I mean, to, to me, you, you've made me some incredible sheaths. The, the sheaths for my, for my sword and dagger from, uh, traditional, uh, traditional Filipino weapons is amazing. 
you're working on a sheath right now for my attention to detail mercantile gentleman's yep. fighter. I can't wait for I that. I just started it this week. Sweet. It's going to be It's going to take some time because I I it usually takes some time for me to kind of come to the actual design that I want. Mm-hmm. I just need to experiment with a little bit. So So lots of cool other stuff from you over the over the years. You made me that that giant um apron with yeah. with a with yep. a big a, a, an apron for working with metal and it's got a a lead plate wrapped in leather <laughs> as a cod piece to protect me from flying metal. It's hilarious. I Thank you, Vic. Thank welcome. you, and my progeny thanks you. But uh, but I have to say, overall, it is definitely the the gauntlet. So I'll make a video. Yeah. There's there's one thing, uh, one detail about it that I think I told you about it. But the the handle of the like when you put your hand in there, the handle is red and black checkered leather braided okay leather. braided i should say a, a red piece and a black piece and those the actual leather that i cut those strips from or were from grandpa's estate so when when he died mom got a lot of his tools a lot of his stuff i don't know i didn't get a lot of it too i don't know where most of it went because they had moved to florida and so he probably just liquidated a lot of that stuff himself but i got some leather making tools and from mom and some of his leather and that the handle is from his uh, his leather. That's cool. So, I, I think I knew yeah. that at one point and and had forgotten. That's cool. But 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 before I end the conversation of the pit fighting gauntlet, I just want to say one of the things about it that is so appealing is the overall aesthetic. It looks like something that's cobbled together by a pit fighter who's just like, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I'm going to put this piece of leather on because it will remind me of my victory when I you know when I killed Grog. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, and, and the spikes, some of the spikes are, are kind of randomly placed and, uh, it, it's just a cool thing. So thank you for that. Uh, I know sure. I'm going to make a video and people are going to want one. So, uh, I, I don't, I, I think, I think <laughs> that was, <laughs> I think that was a, a, uh, a time and a space in history that will probably not, not see, uh, a, a repeat. <laughs> yeah. Well, Vic, uh, it's been, it's been fun talking about some, I mean, I, I like you, I have endless, uh, I cut myself stories. Um, <laughs> but I think we'll, I think we'll wrap it up. You know what? I'll, I'll, I'll say one more. I'll say one more story. And, and people have heard this one before, but every time I think of it, it, it makes me laugh and it, it makes me feel a little bit humble. Okay. So I've done the Filipino martial arts for, for a while. I've had periods of serious intensity with it where I've gotten really good and, uh, periods that are more fallow, like now where I still have my skills, but I'm not as, you know, not as spry uh, yeah. until I start going back and training. But from time to time have been a show off. And I was at a party in in <laughs> New York at, at my neighbor's house. Uh, well, it was a loft. So it was a, my neighbor's apartment. And there were a couple of girls there, one one of whom was a neighbor that was just a very, you know, I wanted to impress her. And they were there and the party had just started. So there was a lot of room and it was just the core group of people, you know, one of whom I wanted to impress, a few of whom I thought were cute or whatever. And uh, the the guy whose party this was was like, oh, you'll like this, Bob. And he brings out a sword cane. It was like some antique. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is cool, you know. And so I, you know, I kind of, oh, you know, pull it out and oh, this looks like it's from the eighteen hundred, whatever. You know, I'm just uh, yammering, trying to trying to be impressive. And then I start uh, flipping it around, like, oh, if this were mine, I could hold the the cane in one hand and the sword in the other, and I could do double stick kali, you know. And I start showing off. <laughs> And then suddenly the, 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 um, my right hand stops moving and the blade stops moving. Where is it? I don't see it out in front of me. And then I, I realize, oh, it's, <sighs> it's in my calf. I jammed it <sighs> somehow. I stabbed it about two and a half inches into my calf. Um, kind of almost parallel with the, with the bone. <sighs> and, uh, you know, like you, the blood waited for a second was like, I, I can't, I can't, I can't hold it anymore. And then the blood started to trickle. <laughs> We're going in. And luckily I was, I was, one door away from my own place. So, you know, I, I I guess I assumed everyone was watching me and really no one gave a damn. I was just some dude flipping around a sword cane while other people are just trying to like meet each other and get drunk or whatever. And, uh, and so I wasn't the center of attention. I hobbled out. I, I bandaged myself up and uh, cleaned off the blade, brought it back and discreetly gave it to him. And, uh, yeah, that, that was it. And, and, and I think of that sometimes when I, when I start thinking I'm, I'm, I'm all that. <laughs> like, yeah, but that's funny. You still do that kind of stuff, like yeah. with some regularity. 
Anyway, Victor, it's it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being awesome. my brother. Thanks for being hey. an awesome brother and a and thanks a blade for being enabler. So terrific. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, this is terrific. It's been real terrific to talk to you. <laughs> I don't know if you want to adopt another brother because uh, being a blade enabler, I, you know, I'm all, I'm all for that. <laughs> but I guess I'll have to, our, our listeners can't see, but I guess I'll have to grow a beard. Yeah, that's right. We record this with video enabled so we can see each other, but uh, it's hard to tell you two apart. Well, before, uh, I was saying before the, the ubiquity of uh, caller ID, our own father couldn't tell us apart on the phone. Yeah. Uh, he'd answer the phone, uh, Vic, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Bob. Okay. <laughs> well, Jim, you're a brother from another mother, my man. Hey, hey, son, always works well. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, son, how much? Well, I'm telling you that that was pretty fun for me. I, I was laughing the whole time you guys were talking. I'm, you know, from from memories of granddad. That's always special. But uh, trips to the emergency room because of knife injuries. To <laughs> my favorite, I think, playing with hand grenades as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> the good old days. But, uh, that's right. Yes. The good old days. That was the 70s. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, podcast as much as I have. Uh, I do want to remind you that our podcast today is brought to you by QuickBooks Self-Employed, your year-round tax solution. It's a must-have for contractors, freelancers, anyone who is self-employed. And if you'll go to the knifejunkie.com slash QB30, Knife Junkies will get a free 30-day trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. Again, 30 days for free at the knifejunkie.com. This is episode number thir- uh, 74 of The Knife Junkie. You can find show notes, and uh, maybe we'll get some pictures from Vic and uh, Bob for some of these uh, knives and blades that they've talked about. We'll try to add them to the page at thenifejunkie.com slash 74. Before we wrap up, guys, one really quick word from each of you as we as we wrap up this podcast. I, I'll, I'll just say that uh, it's, it's fun taking this journey with you. Um, I have... Uh, I have a couple of knives that you gave me here. This broken skull, which has gone up into the mountains with me for probably the th- last three years in a row. There's this clip it Endura that you got me or that you gave to me after 9-11, which I really I carried for a long time for years after that event. And then my absolute favorite, this Bob is the knife that you made me. And um, so I don't have a name for it, but but I love it. Maybe I'll call it El Cid. Um, the Bob. But the, but it's, I mean, the thing I like about it is the, to me, the blade shape really kind of captures the aesthetic of your, um, of, of your art. I mean, I've seen a lot, I've seen the shape in your art before. And so yeah. it was really cool, cool to get it. I made a little kind of chintzy leather sheath for it just because I haven't had the time yet to build a really awesome one for it. But that's common. Cool. Well, some of my uh, absolute favorite uh, podcasts here have been interviews with brothers, like the Todd brothers or the Williamson brothers or father and son, uh, Grant and Gavin Hawk. It's uh, for me, I, I really love hearing the how people share the experience of of having this uh, um, interest in knives. Uh, and so it was really great to have you on, Vic. Uh, you and I can go on endlessly like this. And, uh, but we've kept it clean, which is good too. I know, <laughs> right. I know, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, there is a time limit, so we won't let you continue on yeah. too much further, yeah. but, uh, but, but maybe we can have Vic back on again. And I think, uh, I know I've enjoyed it and I think our listeners, uh, uh, have enjoyed it too, uh, hearing some of these stories. I'm sure there's many more that we could get into. Yes, there are. Indeed. And Bob mentioned, uh, some of the past guests, the brothers, the father and son. You can find uh, all of those uh, past episodes of the Knife Junkie podcast if you go to the knifejunkie.com slash listen. All the uh, podcast episodes are right there on the website. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie person. I want to thank you for joining us on episode number 74 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 